This video was made possible by CuriosityStream and Nebula. In today's video, we're going to examine how trans rights, and trans people more broadly, are discussed in the media. In particular, we're going to explore how an increasing obsession with the so-called trans debate, even in news outlets which describe themselves as liberal or progressive, has created a cultural environment in which deeply dehumanising arguments can be framed as entirely reasonable, sensible contributions to a respectable discussion. Doing so is, naturally, going to involve looking at a bunch of examples of people making transphobic arguments. So if that doesn't sound like something you need in your life right now, feel free to give this one a miss. Which. On the theme of things I wish I could give a miss, I'm afraid we need to start at the extremes. By talking for slightly longer than I would like about transphobic provocateur and Daily Wire host, Matt Walsh. On the 1st of June 2022, the conservative news site turned media company The Daily Wire released an original documentary called What is a Woman? Directed by Justin Folk and presented by Matt Walsh, the promo for the film suggested that it would be an inquisitive attempt by a controversial yet committed truth seeker to gain some clarity around contemporary attitudes towards sex and gender, with a particular focus on gender transition. What are you doing here? I'm asking these questions. Okay. I'm trying to figure out what a woman is, that's why I'm here. And this is the Women's March, I figured this is a good place to find out. I've come all this way to ask that question. Can anyone tell me what a woman is? If you are not here for women, we ask you to leave. What is that? Oh, How am I harassing? I'm asking a question. As anyone with even the slightest knowledge of Matt Walsh, or any of the other weird little dudes at the Daily Wire will have come to expect, however, this is nonsense. In reality, the film is little more than a 90-minute diatribe against trans people. The film can broadly be divided into three kind of acts. The first, which we'll talk about in more detail later, does broadly cling to the pretense of Walsh being a well-intentioned documentarian. I'm a husband. I'm a father of four. I host a talk show. I give speeches. I write books. I like to make sense of things. As we'll see later, Walsh certainly asks some, uh, probing questions of his subjects. But the first 20 minutes of the documentary are spent mostly interviewing healthcare professionals and one academic who are either trans themselves or trans affirming in their practices. What do you, what do you mean by assigned female? Who, who assigns female? Yeah. I say mostly interviewing trans affirming professionals because perhaps to reassure the Daily Wire's core audience that the documentary's not going to be too even handed. They also managed to squeeze in a chat with this guy, whose qualifications to appear in a documentary about trans rights and healthcare amount to him running a Star Wars shop. And also, I guess, this. Because I got a dick. Huh. Even if one is charitable enough to take the more reasonable seeming sections in this first act at face value, however, by the second section of the film, the pretense of reasonable, disinterested inquiry has been dropped entirely. Over the course of the next 50 minutes, we're introduced to an ever-expanding cast of anti-trans activists and conspiracy theorists. Now, with some of these interviewees, you can at least see how they've developed the views they hold. This guy, Scott Nugent, for example, clearly had a very bad experience with transition. I'm a biological woman that medically transitioned to appear like a male. I will never be a man. And while he talks a lot of dangerous nonsense in this interview, freely misinterpreting research and citing some completely made up statistics, there's obviously some real hurt 
that's led to Nugent being sat in that chair opposite Matt Walsh. Most of the interviewees, however, are serial right-wing grifters, for whom the current anti-trans moral panic is just the latest focal point in a long-standing traditionalist agenda. Take this woman, Miriam Grossman, for instance. Where other medical professionals interviewed during the film are portrayed as completely unhinged cranks, Grossman is offered up as one of the good ones, unspoiled by so-called gender ideology. Which is unsurprising, given that prior to boarding the right-wing disinformation gravy train a decade ago, Grossman seems to have spent most of her medical career as an in-house college psychiatrist, rather than having any kind of specialism in trans healthcare. The most revealing of the several segments which feature Grossman comes about 50 minutes into the documentary, when Grossman is asked to talk about school. The particular idea that the film is trying to plant in our heads at this point is that schools are somehow encouraging children who would otherwise be completely content with the gender that they were assigned at birth to falsely come out as trans. As evidence for this, Grossman holds up a book called It's Perfectly Normal. Okay, it's perfectly normal for 10 years and up. In order to highlight its age recommendation, she's even drawn arrows pointing to the box on the cover as though it's some um, secret and not printed in eye-catching red. Within the context of everything we've been hearing about in the film so far, one would assume that this book is some kind of instruction manual, teaching kids how to become trans. Yet, that's not what It Perfectly Normal is at all. This book is actually a pretty broad primer on puberty, sex, and relationships. The copy of the book that Grossman shows to Walsh was published way back in 1994. That's a full 28 years and almost my entire lifetime ago. Do you want to guess how many references to trans people there are in this book? If you guessed only one, you would be incorrect because it's zero. <laughs> An updated version of the book published in 2014 did amend this, but even then, whilst it's quite a nice affirmational little section, it only amounts to 12 fairly short sentences which do little more than explain that trans people exist. It only promotes becoming trans to the extent that this encyclopedia of South American birds promotes becoming a horned screamer. Side note, cracking cover design job on that book, by the way. It's proper top stuff. Always judge a book by its cover. While most of what is a woman's anger is reserved for trans people then, there are also plenty of moments when these broader right-wing resentments slip out. Grossman, for example, turns out not only to be against acknowledgements of trans and queer people in schools, but in favour of abolishing sex and relationships education entirely. I also need to give a shout out to this guy, the incredibly named Carl Truman, who gives us this gem. We need to acknowledge that there are powerful lobby groups, powerful cultural and political lobby groups driving this thing. Uh, Hollywood is pressing LGBTQ plus matters in so many movies. We're seeing it in the way Amazon sets up its algorithms. You heard it here first, folks. The Amazon algorithm is gay now. Joking aside, by the third act of the film, what is a woman has become driven entirely by unhinged conspiracism. There's also a stylistic shift in which we leave behind the talking head format which has dominated the film thus far and are invited to follow Walsh as he undertakes a series of stunts intended to expose the absurdity of so-called gender ideology. I'm done asking questions. One of these stunts sees Walsh write a children's book called Johnny the Walrus about a young boy who, wait for it, identifies as a walrus. Johnny's a boy with a big imagination. One day he's a dog, the next day a crustacean. Johnny's mom loves her son's make-believe time. You're Johnny the walrus till you change your mind. This is obviously a super original gag, and not just a lazy cross between 
I sexually identify as an attack helicopter and that 2018 episode of Last Week Tonight in which John Oliver released a satirical children's book about Mike Pence's bunny rabbit. The more visceral third act stunt, however, is that in which Walsh attends a school board meeting in Loudoun County, Virginia. The background here is that Loudoun County School Board was looking to pass a set of policies which would, among other things, require teachers to use students' correct pronouns and affirm trans students' right to use the bathrooms which correspond with their gender. In truth, this was simply a formalisation of already common practices in local schools. Yet, right-wingers descended on the county in an attempt to turn it into a cause celebre. As the film tells it, Walsh travels over from his home in Nashville to join the Raucous. Yet, when he gets there, he finds that the school board has introduced rules requiring anyone who wants to attend a meeting to prove that they're a resident of the county. Which, yeah, obviously. Nevertheless, Walsh finds a solution. That's right, conservative commentator Matt Walsh told me he's leasing out someone's basement in Loudoun County so he'd be able to speak during tonight's meeting. Which, I will say, there's an amazing lack of self-awareness to a guy as generally creepy as Matt Walsh going to such great lengths to gain access to a school building, including hiring out a basement, which is objectively the creepiest of all residential dwellings, and then for him to accuse others of having ill intentions for children. The sequence ends with Walsh giving his speech to the school board meeting. The address is the cruel, hate-filled screed of a religious fundamentalist. It involves accusing school administrators of being child abusers, a cult, fanatics for the simple act of trying to create a safe learning environment for some of their most vulnerable students. These 60 seconds are really the truth of the all that pretense at genuine inquiry and the attempts at comedy are stripped away. And what we're left with is an insecure grifter using children as a prop to push a cruel, transphobic agenda. Of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, this was always going to be the case. The Daily Wire was never going to have produced an even-handed, informative documentary about gender and gender transition. But Despite the fact that this section ended up being long, this is not really a video about The Daily Wire or Matt Walsh or What is a Woman. See, what kept jumping out to me as I watched this film was how familiar the tone of those early sections in which Walsh interviews trans-affirming professionals felt. And not to the work of other extreme right-wing provocateurs, but the manner in which many supposedly respectable mainstream news outlets, particularly in the UK, have increasingly begun to frame discussions of trans people and their rights in recent years. But before we go any further, I want to suggest that if you're finding this video interesting, then you might also like to check out another video that I made about the media, which looks at how bad actors on the political right use organisations called think tanks to push certain stories and perspectives in the news. And if you want the best experience for watching that video, then you're going to want to do so on my streaming service, Nebula. Nebula was founded by a bunch of educational and education-adjacent creators who wanted to be less beholden to algorithms and demonetization systems when making videos. Unlike YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, Nebula is owned by the creators who publish on it. This ensures we have more say in how the platform is run and allows us to create bigger and bolder videos for our lovely viewers. That's you, and also to present them in a premium, ad-free viewing experience. One in which, if you follow a creator, you'll actually get a notification when they put out a new video. Once you're finished watching my video about think tanks, for example, you're probably going to want to stick around and watch Second Thoughts videos about media bias, as well as Mia Mulder's video about trans women in sport. Now, if the idea of early and exclusive content from all your favourite creators sounds intriguing, then you're going to want to know that the best way to sign up to Nebula is through a deal that we've put together with the folks over at CuriosityStream. This allows you to get access to both platforms for less than it would cost to sign up to either on its own. 
Where Nebula is the preferred platform of all your favorite indie creators, CuriosityStream gathers together thousands of titles of big budget documentaries from more traditional studios. I recently really enjoyed the three-part series Electing Lincoln, which contains a fascinating episode about the shamelessness with which 19th century American newspaper owners would distort the truth to fit their personal political agendas. I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions as to how much has changed there. But whether your thing is history, nature, science, or travel, Curiosity Stream is bound to have loads of titles that you will absolutely adore. Curiosity Stream and Nebula make for amazing companions to one another, as we've teamed up to put together an incredibly priced bundle deal. If you head to curiositystream.com forward slash Tom Nicholas, you can get access to both Curiosity Stream and Nebula for an entire year for less than $15. Further, in doing so and in using that link, you'll be helping to support my channel and helping me to make more videos like this one. Which will resume momentarily. <laughs>So I guess I need to start by sharing a shocking revelation with you. Britain has a transphobia problem. Okay, unfortunately to many people, that's probably not particularly new information. As the deluge of Turf Island memes one is met with whenever one mentions the UK in certain spaces online might suggest, for several years now, Britain's descent into a full-blown transphobic moral panic has been impossible to ignore. For folks living in the UK, and particularly trans folks living in the UK, it's quite clear that a low hum of transphobic sentiment has become as central to British culture as queuing, fish and chip shops, and laundering the wealth of Russian oligarchs. But the phenomenon has also gained plenty of international attention. American news outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and CNN, have all commissioned British writers to try and make sense of this curious phenomenon for the benefit of perplexed readers outside of the country. And at the political level, the Council of Europe, which monitors human rights abuses and administers the European Convention on Human Rights, issued a formal condemnation of the UK government for backsliding on protections for trans people. How and why the UK arrived at this point is a complicated, multi-factored story which would require an entire video all to itself. What's evident, however, is that the rise of UK transphobia has been an acutely top-down affair. Over in the US, the stereotypical transphobe is most likely to be a MAGA hat wearing, small town dwelling, fundamentalist Christian. By contrast, the leaders of Britain's anti trans crusade have been secular, wealthy, educated metropolitans. Furthermore, where in other countries the fueling of bigoted sentiment is usually the preserve of arguably fringe right wing outlets such as The Daily Wire or Breitbart. In the UK, a suspicion towards trans people has come to guide the reporting of media institutions across the political spectrum. In fact, among the publications that have been most influential in rallying opposition to trans rights in Britain have been The Guardian and The New Statesman. These are periodicals which are thought of within British culture as being progressive to the point of parody. Yet both have seemingly adopted opposition to trans rights as a central plank of their editorial line. The relationship between this British form of polite, liberal transphobia and the more obviously cruel, conservative transphobia typified by what is a woman is complicated. In July 2022, the accidental queen of the UK movement, JK Rowling, had a brief interaction with Matt Walsh on Twitter. Rowling criticised Walsh's self-aggrandising approach, only to then praise what is a woman as doing a good job exploding the incoherence of gender identity theory and some of the harms it's done. Julie Bindle, a journalist who has been a key figure in popularising trans-exclusionary radical feminism in Britain over the past two decades, similarly claimed that whilst the film had loads of sexism in it, it was still well worth a watch. 
For context, this is a film for which this is the final scene. What is a woman? An adult human female. Who needs help opening this? Still, well worth a watch for all good feminists, I guess. Nevertheless, Rowling and Bindle are somewhat unique in that both have been entirely consumed by transphobia to the point that it's become their whole brand. I mean, I guess you've got to pivot to something when no one wants to watch your films anymore. Given the prominence afforded to what is a woman by the wild amounts of money that The Daily Wire spent promoting the film, including more than $1 million in ad spend on Facebook alone, it was probably impossible for liberals that have gone all in on transphobic moral panic to avoid some kind of alliance of convenience with Walsh and his fan base. Elsewhere in the British media, most journalists would be infuriated if you suggested that the reporting that they do at the BBC or Sky News or Wales Online or wherever else had anything in common with the openly hateful, opportunistic bigotry of Matt Walsh and The Daily Wire. In fact, in 2019, the Independent Press Standards Organisation published this report, which sought to analyse changing trends in how British newspapers had reported on trans issues in the years between 2009 and 2019. And pretty much all of the editors and other newspaper staff interviewed for the study were adamant that journalists have adopted a more respectful approach to stories concerning transgender subjects than at the start of the decade. Now, there is one very small way in which this is true. As that same report highlighted, over the past decade, there has been a significant drop-off in the use of outright slurs in trans-adjacent newspaper articles. In 2009 and 2010, around 10% of articles about trans people published in the British media used language which the study very generously describes as being considered offensive. By 2019, that figure was down to just 1%, which well done, British media. You did it. You solved transphobia. Okay, obviously not. Don't get me wrong, a decrease in outright slurs is clearly good. But that alone doesn't mean that the reporting that you're doing is necessarily respectful or balanced or even accurate. All of which brings us to this clip. A British politician and current leader of the UK Labour Party, Keir Starmer being interviewed by the BBC's Andrew Marr. Now, those of you watching from outside the UK probably don't spend a massive portion of your time thinking about the UK Labour Party. And I envy you. Really, I do. But Starmer is essentially the platonic ideal of the wannabe sensible centrist. He's super reluctant to make any policy pledges and is highly conflict averse in interviews. He essentially makes Joe Biden look like a peppy, charismatic radical. Some of this timidity was on display in his chat with Andrew Marr. The exchange was recorded in September 2021 in Brighton, where the Labour Party were holding their annual conference. This was Starmer's first such event as party leader, and against a backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, a government corruption scandal, and plenty of internal party divisions at the conference itself, the question which Ma was desperate for Starmer to answer was this. Is it transphobic to say only women have a cervix? Once more, for those at the back. Is it transphobic? to say only women have a cervix. Okay, so there is some context here relating to Labour MP Rosie Duffield, who over the past year had been performing a kind of low-rent JK Rowling tribute act of making increasingly transphobic comments and then playing the victim whenever people disagreed with her. More interesting than what led to this question being asked, however, is what happens next. See, Starmer's answer wasn't awful. Well, it is uh, something that uh, shouldn't be said. It is not right. But it was kind of awkward. You can almost hear the fan speeding up in his brain as he tries to compute an answer which will please as many people as possible. It is 
uh, something that uh, shouldn't be said. It is not right. But while it might not make for great politics, politicians squirming like this does make for good television. Starmer's awkward non-answer signaled to the media that trans issues were a topic which could be used to catch Labour politicians off guard. When Starmer's colleague and essentially second-in-command Rachel Reeves appeared on radio station LBC the next day, right-wing host Nick Ferrari thus decided to ask her the same question. But I have to put it to you, the same question that was put to the party leader, is it transphobic to say only women have a cervix? Good morning. Which nothing says British journalist in the early 2020s more than asking someone about cervixes before you've even said good morning. Good morning. Reeves's answer also started well. I just think that this issue has just become so divisive and toxic and it pits people against each other, both groups who face discrimination in society, women and trans women. And I just find this debate incredibly unhelpful and, and, and unproductive, to be totally honest. Ah, oh, get on, Rachel. That's a pretty cracking answer, actually. Like, proper decisive. You really nips that one in the bud. But then, when pushed further... Look, is it is it transphobic? Look, I just I don't even know how to start answering these questions. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. God, it was going so well, Rachel. <laughs> From here on out, over the next six months, there was a. 50-50 chance that any appearance by a Labour politician on TV or the radio would, sooner or later, end in them being asked some question about gender and genitalia. Is it transphobic to say only women have a cervix, David? But trans women are women, from your perspective. Is that right? Are you comfortable defining what a woman is? So a woman can have a penis? Do I think that women were born with penises? Yes. Do you agree with her? <sighs> now, Labour Party politicians weren't the only ones being pressed to declare their interpretation of the meaning of womanhood. As we'll see towards the end of this video, in the period since, the Conservative Party has increasingly sought to turn trans rights into a wedge issue. The reason that Labour MPs have had to field these questions so much more than politicians from other parties is that their responses have consistently been absolute car crashes. The mere mention of trans people seems to cause senior Labour Party figures to turn into whimpering little messes. These presenters all probably feel as though they're doing an excellent job here. And by the metrics that really matter in contemporary journalism, they are. These exchanges make for great social media content and tend to get a decent amount of clicks. Far more, at least, than videos of politicians talking about taxes or whatever else. But that aside, in these interviews, even the most right-wing of these presenters will no doubt comfort themselves that they've not sought to push an agenda at all here, but have merely been asking questions. This facade of just asking questions often allows journalists to convince themselves as much as their viewers that they are of a completely different breed to motivated conspiracists like Matt Walsh. They're not screaming in the faces of a school board accusing them of child abuse, but talking calmly and politely in the studio of a respected news organisation. And yet, Walsh spends a good hour of his film warming up to that big finale. For the entire opening third of What is a Woman, his approach is practically identical to that of these mainstream British news presenters. And this got me thinking, maybe there's an opportunity here. Even if we acknowledge that there are some important differences between what is a woman and these interviews in the British media, maybe the abundant similarities have a lot to teach us about what's really going on in these discussions about gender and trans rights in the UK press.
Now, some of you might be thinking that it's a bit strange to have gotten this far through a video about journalists obsessing over the definition of the word woman without having provided some kind of answer to that question. Surely by now there should have been a section in which I crack the spine on some dusty old copy of the Oxford English Dictionary and take you through some etymology or something. Which, if I did, would reveal that the word derives from the Old English term wifman or wife person, which seems a little bit problematic. The fact of the matter is, however, that none of the interviewers in any of the conversations we've looked at in this video are remotely interested in the definition of womanhood. Let me explain. See, if you sit down to watch what is a woman, you will very quickly notice that its style is pretty derivative. As I mentioned earlier, it outright pinches gags from John Oliver and also takes some cues from Michael Moore and from The Daily Show. The cultural reference that kept leaping into my mind as I was watching the film, however, was this guy. My name is Bora. I like you. As a reminder, in this first act of What is a Woman, Matt Walsh almost exclusively interviews healthcare professionals and one academic who are trans-affirming in their practices. If we take the film on face value, this is supposed to be Walsh giving supporters of trans rights an opportunity to explain their understanding of sex and gender. Throughout, however, it's evident that Walsh is playing something of a character. Of course, I don't doubt that Matt Walsh is a pretty intellectually incurious guy, but he's obviously pamming it up a bit. I mean, with a very slightly different framing, this could all be a very, very good parody of the exact genre of confused by modern life bloke that Matt Walsh is. Being a dad is one of the great privileges of my life. Give my son a BB gun, and that's just about all the emotional support he needs. <laughs> yeah, I, I also hate my kids. Maybe this is simply some good, old-fashioned, self-depreciating humour. Even a humorless loser like me occasionally enjoys a bit of self-ridicule. But the more I watched of What is a Woman, the more it became evident that Matt Walsh being a little bit intellectually challenged is actually pretty essential for the film to work. See, as we discussed earlier, the idea that Walsh is out on some genuine fact-finding mission is a complete facade. The real premise of this first portion of the film is the left is crazy and no one is able to say what a woman is anymore. The problem for Walsh and the production team is that many of his interviewees actually do provide fairly decent answers to that question. Take Marty Bauer's response, for instance. A woman is a you know, it's a combination of your physical attributes and then what you're showing to the world and the gender clues that you give. And hopefully those match your gender identity. Now, not everyone will agree with this definition, but for the film to work, Walsh can't just disagree with the definition that someone provides. That definition needs to be absolutely nonsensical. Whenever he's given any answer to his question, which accepts that gender might be a tiny bit more complicated than just woman equals vagina, then Walsh has to act like a complete simpleton, as though his brain just can't compute anything beyond a very basic level of reasoning. The most ridiculous example of this happens slightly later in the film, after Walsh asks gender studies professor Patrick Krasanka to help him understand the difference between sex and gender. This starts off normal enough. What we tend to think about in the social sciences today is that sex refers to a set of biological characteristics and gender is a social construct or category. But then a piece of classical music starts to fade in and the film begins to skip parts of Grzanka's answer, as if to imply that it's really long and pretentious which has the secondary effect of making it look like Walsh's brain just melts the instant that he hears a word longer than two syllables. You think you can explain things to me? Well, checkmate leftists, cause I'm an idiot. At the end of the day, there is no answer that any of Walsh's trans-affirming interviewees could give that would suffice. Because 
As with Borat, the goal here isn't to genuinely interrogate these interviewees' expertise, but to simply ask them question after question until they say something that sounds a bit silly. And that's before we even get into the fact that, like those in Borat, all of these interviews were secured under false pretenses. There's more than an element of this in the exchanges that we've been looking at from the British media, too. In one interview, we even see a repeat of this pantomime of acting as though any definition of womanhood, which acknowledges that cervixes might not be everything, is treated as though it's beyond the limits of human comprehension. I think it's because a lot of people listening would say, well, I know what a woman is, it's really straightforward. And then it feels that politicians start to get themselves into, into rabbit holes about this. The added awfulness here is that, where Walsh at least has the decency to play the idiot himself, the UK equivalent typically involves affluent, privately educated nepotism babies like Stig Abel here, suggesting that it's their audience who is too thick to understand what's going on. Way to pay back the fans, Stig. Crucially, even when politicians have leaned towards the kinds of trans-exclusionary responses that it seems that these journalists are looking for, that hasn't been enough either. After being asked several times for her definition of woman, for example, Labour MP Annalise Dodds began to distance herself from support for trans rights. When asked if she agreed with a colleague that women could be born with penises, she gave this jumbled answer. Um, well, no, I, I don't agree with her. Biological females um, obviously aren't. Of course, there are also a trans women who've made a transition in their gender, but sex is not the same as gender. Did this mealy-mouthed response put the matter to bed? No, of course not. The channel in question still clipped the interview for social media, and further headlines followed about the Labour Party being torn apart by the so-called trans debate. On one level then, the question, what is a woman, is simply being used as a means of securing a gotcha moment, in which, by pulling the right faces whilst their interviewee responds, a presenter can portray them as being either stupid, disingenuous, or out of touch. You can't get me with your big ideas about gender! For Matt Walsh, this is an attempt to discredit his political opponents. For British journalists, it is partly about trying to push the Labour Party to the right on social issues, but also about presenters wanting to generate some buzz about their respective shows on social media through taking advantage of the inherent virality of these clips. There is another, more important, function that the question, what is a woman, serves in all these interviews, however. And that is the pseudo-philosophical veneer that such a focus on picking apart the meaning of words and concepts gives to the conversation. Suddenly, we're not just doing boring old politics anymore, we're doing metaphysics, baby! It just brings such a refined academic air to the proceedings. Matt Walsh really leans into this during the opening act of his film, and it leads to some incredible voiceover moments. Truth is, I'm not very good at fishing. But what is truth? Is there a truth? Is this what progress looks like? Can my boys really become girls? Do I have four daughters? Do I now have to pay for four weddings? Is there a son trapped in my daughter's body? If so, how do I get them out? Are any of my kids who they claim to be? Who are these people? Who am I? Seriously, it would be impossible to write a sketch satirizing Matt Walsh because it would just be word for word this. A similar desire to want to feel like an intellectual no doubt also fuels presenters like Stig Abel and Nick Ferrari and Andrew Marr all of whom get a chance to role-play as Plato for five minutes. But the most important effect of this philosophical gesturing is the manner in which it allows everyone involved in these debates to pretend that this conversation is primarily about abstract ideas. We're just discussing definitions here, guys. When, in reality, that's far from the case. See, as is evident in the trajectory of Matt Walsh's documentary, 
The question, what is a woman, is really just a stand-in for do you think trans people exist? Which is itself a stand-in for more practical questions about what rights should be extended to trans people, what healthcare they should have access to, and whether they should be able to live free from harassment. While the motivations may be slightly less clear, this is equally true of the interviews that we've been looking at from the British media. Journalists don't make a habit out of asking high-ranking politicians abstract philosophical questions for no reason. The motivation for doing so here, then, is because they believe that the definition of womanhood that these interviewees provide will be indicative of how they might vote on legislation relating to trans rights. The question, what is a woman, is thus a way to push politicians to commit to supporting or opposing trans rights without, you know, coming across as too divisive. Of course, there are elements of the British media that are more than happy to engage in very direct, open fear-mongering about trans people. However, that kind of journalism only really works among a certain crowd. More mainstream audiences will often be turned off by rhetoric which comes across as too outwardly hateful. The team which produced What is a Woman seems very aware of this. There's a reason. The first 25 minutes of the film seems so mild for something produced by the Daily Wire. It needs that time to set Walsh up as a reasonable, respectable journalist. To anyone who is only coming across his work for the first time, this functions to present the hate, which so clearly fuels his later stunts as the outcome of the conversations that he's had during the making of this film, rather than a textbook case of right-wing fear of the other. This isn't to say that I necessarily think that any of these journalists are likely to be giving speeches at turf rallies anytime soon, but it's clear that each of them, and their producers, feel some level of professional jealousy when they see the attention which inflammatory articles about the so-called trans debate attract. This pseudo-philosophical language thus provides an opportunity in the form of a level of plausible deniability. They're able to participate in this controversial debate, or sometimes not even mentioning trans people by name at all. Most British journalists would thus like to think that there is an ocean between themselves and Matt Walsh. Okay, obviously there is a literal ocean between them most of the time, but I mean a metaphorical one as well. Journalists such as those that we've looked at in this video would perhaps stress that their reporting lacks the kind of open hostility towards trans people that defines the output of institutions like the Daily Wire. Yet, just as that more timid opening act of what is a woman works to legitimise the more openly hateful sequences that follow, so too have these pseudo-intellectual conversations about definitions of womanhood allowed more extreme, transphobic formations to emerge into the mainstream. And perhaps those more recent developments provide a means of drawing this video to a close. While well, the death of old Lizzie has been soaking up the majority of press attention over recent weeks, a time of recording, Britain's transphobic moral panic continues on in earnest. Shortly after I started working on this video, Boris Johnson resigned as Prime Minister of the UK. This meant that his colleagues in the Conservative Party had to elect a new leader. And as a direct result of seeing the anguish that the so-called trans debate appears to cause the Labour Party, Candidates for the position jostled with one another to present themselves as the most opposed to trans rights. Announcing her bid for the party leadership, Suella Braverman gave this moving speech. We need to get rid of all of this woke rubbish and actually get back to a country where describing a man and a woman in terms of biology does not mean that you're going to lose your job. Rishi Sunak similarly launched his campaign with a manifesto for women's rights. In truth, little more than a transphobic dog whistle. Another candidate, Penny Mordaunt, had previously been seen as a rare trans ally within the Conservative Party. Trans men are men, 
trans women are women. On putting herself forward for leader, however, she span like a fidget spinner, posting a Twitter thread about how trans women are not biological women and highlighting her record of fighting trans orthodoxy. Last, but by very no means least, we have Kemi Bazanok, who tried to grab headlines by banning gender-neutral toilets from the venue where she hosted her campaign launch. The problem being that the toilets in question were just two self-contained cubicles, so aides had to stick sad handwritten notes reading men and ladies to the doors. Which I feel the need to say, if you're going to do gendered, anything, it's clearly men and women, or ladies and gentlemen. It's not men and ladies. If you're gonna swing around the gender binary like it's a flipping hammer, then at least get your labels right. I don't think it is an overstatement at all to say that this bout of competitive transphobia by potential prime ministers was provoked almost entirely by the sequence of interviews that we've looked at in this video. Whatever claims they might make about being apolitical, whatever defences they might invoke about how they were just asking questions, these journalists' promotion of the idea that questioning the existence of trans people is a legitimate, even intelligent, pursuit has very real consequences. It doesn't matter whether or not their intentions might be different from those of Matt Walsh, the results are surprisingly similar. But this pseudo-philosophical, riddle me this genre of debate is not only dangerous as a gateway to more openly hostile transphobic politics, it is troubling enough in and of itself, for it is inherently dehumanising. This whole charade about definitions of womanhood denies trans people their humanity, the Pope fears, frustrations and aspirations of actual living, breathing trans people are hidden from view, and this already marginalised community is instead transformed into a philosophical provocation, a linguistic complication. Such a mode of debate obviously makes it much easier for bigotry to grow because it conceals any traces of character and personality and experience that cis people watching these debates might connect with. All of this will no doubt be more than obvious to any trans people watching. Others will also likely have noticed the manner in which these debates mirror those surrounding other marginalised groups. For any cis people watching, however, I think Whenever we find ourselves drawn into these kinds of discussions, it's important not only to make it clear that trans people and lives and rights are not up for debate, but also to re-inject that sense of humanity back into the conversation. Because that sense of shared humanity is the foundation on which real solidarity is built. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that it has been worthy of your time. Uh, if you think that others might get something out of these thoughts as well, then I would love it if you'd consider sharing the video on social media or wherever else. Um, it really does make all the difference. A special thank you, as ever, to Richard, Sindri Nilsson, David Brothers, Alan Gann, Luke Meyer, Gary, Dickon Spain, Bill Mitchell, Al Sveigart, ZC Reese, Shab Kumar, Alexander Blank, Niels Bildgaard, Sophia R, President Dwayne Elizondo, Mountain Dew Herbert Camacho, Sergio Suarez, Nicholas Jacquemart, Strange Weekend, Ricardo Fernandez de Cordoba, Richard Rapoon, Udo, Elliot Day, Amit Singh Paraha, Parker Mead, Karen Rosenau, Gabriel Koch, Demelza, Jimmy Dunn, and Christopher Cowan for being signed up to the top tier of my Patreon. If you would like to join them in getting early access to scripts, uh, early access to videos even, copies of the scripts to them, and more, then you can find out how to do so at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Thank you once again for watching and have a fantastic week.